this morning. Hard truths. Um, hard truths. Hard truths on the camera this morning. Stefan. Oh. So I wanted to do a Stefan, so we, we stream, and, and, so, and, and so Stefan tends to do this, and, and, and the poor camera guy is trying to like, just will you just stay in one space, because it's like so difficult, and, uh, and, and, and you know, so I've, I've learned to, to sort of stand in, in this because of, 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 uh, of the streaming thing. Last week, we started a series on, on Matthew 25, um, and, 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 and I believe it's a series that is vitally important for the Church of Christ to, to hear. Um, and I think, it's, I think it's because this piece of Scripture is, is I, I personally believe it's, it's, it seems to be one of those left out pieces of Scripture, and yet it's such a vital piece of Scripture. Because without Matthew 25, just for what it's worth, you, you don't have Matthew 28. Um, so when Jesus gives the Great Commission to the disciples, he says, go out into all the world and the, baptizing people, make disciples, you know, the Great Commission to go out and make disciples. Um, if you don't have Matthew 25, you, you don't, don't even have a full understanding of what it means to be a disciple, what it means to be a disciple of Jesus, what it means to be a sheep. We all want to be sheep, am I right? Oh, okay. So... I'm going to separate the church now. So those of you that would like to be sheep, those of you that would like to be goats, we all want to be sheep in, in, the, in the context, okay? In the context, we want, we want to be sheep. We want to be a part of the sheep fold. We want to be a part of the flock. We want, to be, we, want to, we want to have Jesus as our shepherd. We want to be in his midst. We want to be surrounded by his presence. We, we want to not just hear his voice, but we want to be able to see him ultimately one day. And now I'm being, I mean, spotlight on, spotlight off. I mean, things are happening on my birthday. It's amen. You know, um, and Matthew 25 for me is... I think Matthew 25 is, is one of the untouched pieces of Scripture, um, and, and I think we, 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 we sort of we browse over it. We read it, oh, that's cool, I want to be a sheep, I don't want to be a goat, that's cool, um, and, and, and we, 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 we go. And, and I think it's something that we need to spend a bit of time in. So that's the series. Last week, we started the series by speaking along the, 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 basic, the basic thing of, 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 of the truth, Jesus is coming again. Okay, so, children of God, men and women of faith, when you hear stuff like that, doesn't matter if it's me saying it, or if it's bishop so-and-so saying it, or if it's apostle so-and-so saying it, or prophet so-and-so saying it, when you hear that Jesus is coming again, there should be a tingling. There should be a move inside of your spirit. There should be something happening inside of you that goes, I am so excited that Jesus is going to be coming again. My Jesus that I love, my Jesus, my Savior, my Jesus is coming again. The day is... Thank you, church. Some of you need to get excited about that because it's the real truth. Jesus is coming again. And that's why it's a hard truth because for some of us, we're like, yeah, yeah I'm not so sure I want Jesus to come again right now. My life's pretty good. I've got a good job. I've got a holiday house. I go away three months of every year. I travel overseas. I do a whole lot of stuff. Um, you know, my family's kind of settled. We're okay. If Jesus comes again, he might rattle and shake up my lifestyle a little bit. I might have to stop a couple of things and readjust my life. Hot truth. Jesus is coming again, and when he comes again, he's coming to do one thing. He's coming to judge. He's coming to separate. You can run from it. You can deny it. You can not believe it all you want, but the Word of God tells us. And so I want to read the full Scripture this morning from Matthew 25 and verse 31, and I want to just touch on, on another hard truth this morning, um, and then we'll see where God takes us. Um, throughout the rest of the series. So from Matthew 25 and from verse 31, the sheep and the goats is the heading in my Bible. When the Son of Man comes in His glory and all the angels with Him, He will sit on, all, he will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. All the nations will be gathered before Him and He will separate the people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on His right and the goats on His left then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. Last week, 
Jesus is coming. And this is the reality that we need to prepare for. But then he goes on to say, For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you, see, see you a stranger and invite you in or needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and go and visit you? The king will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did for one of the least of these, you did for me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not invite me in. I needed clothes, and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison, and you did not look after me. They also will answer Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth. Whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away to eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. Maybe we don't preach that because it's hard. Because it's truth. Maybe we don't preach it because we live in a world that's all about, it's okay. Do your own thing. Just pop into church every now and again. Say a couple of prayers. Give a bit of money. As long as you feel good about Jesus, Jesus is going to feel good about you. We live in a world that seems to give that kind of theology, seems to give that kind of Christianity. It's about It's about feeling good. It's about what I can get out of my faith, what I can get out of of, of my journey with Jesus. But I get the sense that what Jesus was saying is that there is a prize awaiting you. There is a gift in eternity awaiting you. So there is something that you're going to get out of all of this. But in order for you to be a child of God, in order for you to be a sheep in the sheepfold, in order for you to be able to hear the shepherd's voice, then you need to start being a person that gives, that does for the sake and the cause of Christ, for his people, for his heartbeat, for his mission, for his ministry for who He is and what He stands for, not what we as the world stand for, not what people stand for. Jesus is coming again. It's a truth that we can't get away of. And we as the sheep, we need to be obedient to His voice. Those are the words of Jesus. Somebody once said to me, the Bible is very clear, it's black and white. There's no gray areas in the Bible. And I said, yeah, but if you get into a new Testament Bible, and you get some of the new and more modern Bibles, it's not just black and white ink on the page. There's also some red inside there. And the words of Jesus have been highlighted in red in the modern translations, the modern, the modern prints. And they're highlighted in red for a reason, because these are not the words of any man. These are the words of God himself. And if Jesus says that's important for us to do, surely it's something that we need to take a little bit of time and spend a little, bit of, a little bit of energy and a little bit of time and try and understand what it is that God is calling us into. Do you remember Peter in the Bible? Anybody? Remember Pete? Remember Peter? So P- Peter's, okay, for those of you that are like, huh, Peter? Okay, Peter was one of the disciples. Um, he's the disciple that betrays Jesus. Um, no, that's Judas. Ah, yeah, you're listening, eh? Peter's the one that denies Jesus. Huh? Three times, right? 
Yeah, he denies Jesus. And then after Jesus' resurrection, after, after he's been raised from the dead, after he's kind of met with the disciples, he has this meeting with Peter. You remember the story? And he, and he meets with Peter, and, he, and, he, and he's busy restoring Peter. He's busy um, giving Peter back his, his, his ministry, back his, 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 his apostleship, if I can put it that way. He's busy giving Peter back the call into ministry. He's busy bringing Peter back into the sheepfold, saying to Peter, it's okay. It's okay, Peter. And what are the words that Jesus says to Peter? He says to Peter, Peter, do you love me? Peter, do you love me? Church, do you love Jesus? Yes? Yes? Do you love Jesus? Yes. Then feed his sheep. Then feed his sheep. Jesus says it three times to Peter. He restores Peter back into ministry, back into a place. But Jesus didn't have to say that to Peter. He should have asked, Peter, do you love me? Peter's response was, yes, Lord, I love you. And he could have said, Peter, I forgive you. I understand what it means to be human. Peter, I understand that in that moment, in that space of, 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 of like, like just that, that moment, that space, that, that your feelings got the better of you and that, and that you just you denied me because you were scared, because you were frightened, because you saw what was happening to me and you knew that the crucifixion was a reality. Peter, I understand. It's okay. Peter, I forgive you. Come and give me a hug. Pete, come. Jesus could have said a whole variety of things. He could have brought Peter back into a space of ministry. He could have restored Peter just by, by, by just being, being there. But yet he makes a specific command to Peter. He gives a specific instruction. He says, Peter, do you love me? And then feed my sheep. Tend my lambs, feed my sheep. And if we say that we love Jesus... Then we need to take what he says to us seriously because we're all Peters in our own space and in our own moments and in our own lives. We've all denied Christ. We've all stood in a situation and a circumstance where we just felt that it was so hard and if we just, and we kept quiet when we should have spoken. We didn't act when we should have acted. We've all been there. We've all done it. Some of us when we were baby Christians, some of us when we were more mature Christians, we've all been in that situation where we've been in spa or we've been in pick and pay or we've been in checkers or we've been in whatever, whatever. We've been in there and somebody in front of us has been absolutely abusive and just out of line with the teller, with the person working behind the till. And it hasn't just been out of line. It's been language and it's been stuff and we've all felt it in our being just to say something. And we've kept quiet because we didn't want to stir up and cause a bigger, whatever the reasons. But if we are called to follow Christ this morning, then we are called to come into a space where we hear the words of Jesus, where we stand up. If he wants to restore us, if he wants to bring us back into ministry, if he wants to use us in the mighty way that Peter was used, then we need to just hear the words and say, here I am, Lord. I'm your sheep, Lord. I hear your voice. I'm obedient to my, your voice. Lord, I want to do what you call me to do. You see, Jesus offers us redemption. He offers us a place of making right, a, a time to get it right. We are called to go out and to feed the sheep. God wants us to be fed physically, emotionally, and spiritually. God wants us to be fed he doesn't want anybody. You know, you know what, and this is, this is hard, and, and, and if this is online, I, I pray that this, this, this piece that I'm going to say now would go worldwide and would touch the hearts of Christians across the world. There is enough food in the world today to feed everybody on planet Earth. There is enough food on Earth today Produced, manufactured in storehouses, in, in, in supermarkets, in, in, in grocery stores, in whatever. There is enough food to feed every single human being and every animal, if you want to get technical about it, on earth today. And yet as we speak now, there's a child busy dying of starvation. As we speak now, there are families who are sitting in homes that do not have food. Do not have food in their hearts. Where is the church of Christ? How have we allowed 
this to happen. When Jesus' words are so, so very clear, feed the hungry. When I was hungry, you did it for the least of these. Feed the hungry. Maybe it's time that we as a church just, got, got, just did something more than what we do. And we do do a lot of stuff. We do. We're out there. We, we have our soup kitchen, which operates six, six days a week. We, we have the Let's Feed Jesus that goes out on a Friday night. We do food parcels. However basic they might be, it's at least something that we're giving. We can help. We can feed. I mean, God wants to provide. God does provide. When the Jewish people, when the Israel, when they were in the desert and they had no food, there was manna that came from heaven. It wasn't necessarily the best, and they didn't like it because they wanted this, that, and the next thing. But God provides. And if God provides for us, He gives us enough to provide for somebody else. We are called to be a people that take seriously what it means to feed the hungry. And Jesus, when he was on the mountain and he, he gave that great sermon on the mountain, he looks and, 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 he, and he sees the 5,000 and he got, takes, takes the, the simple, the bread and the fish that isn't enough to even feed those in the front row. And yet he breaks it and he multiplies it because God wants everybody to have. That's the heart of God. And God has given us, He's equipped us, he's, he's positioned us as His church to be His hands and His feet, to be the ones that provide that which He has already provided, to, to take it, the resources, and to distribute it. Right now, there are warehouses that are sitting with sell-by-date stuff that has not gone out to the AIDS places. When I say the AIDS, the, the, the relief aid places. They're sitting with food. It hasn't made it onto the truck, and what they will do is they'll either dump it in the ocean or they'll burn it in a field. That is evil at the heart of everything that is evil, that people will be dying because they did not have, because people are so overwhelmed with power and with authority and with money, with wealth and self. But it's time that we got real with this. You've all heard the story of the little girl who's on the beach, and it's... it's, it's uh, it's spring tide and all the starfish have washed onto the beach. You've all heard it in different forms and shapes. But let me remind you of it. And there's this old man that walks down on the beach and he sees the little girl and what she's doing is she's picking up each starfish and she's throwing them back. And there's thousands upon thousands of them that have been washed up. She's picking one up and she throws it back into the ocean. And the man says to the little girl, he says, what are you doing? You can't save them all. And she turns around and she says, yes, I know I can't save them all, but I can save just this one. And so I'll make a difference just to this one and to the next one and to the next one. We won't be able to save everybody, but we can save somebody. We won't be able to feed everybody, but we can feed somebody. And if one of us feeds one person and two feeds two, and five, you with me? And five feeds five, then we sit with a church of 250 people, we can feed 250 people. Because we have been blessed. We have been blessed. In the Western world, we throw away more food than what we eat. We go to South African bras. And I don't know what it is about the Afrikaans folk, and it is them. I'm sorry. It's, we're going to blame the Afrikaans folk here. I'll do due penance in, mean, in, in, in due time. But we go to a bra, and it's me. It's me and my family. But I've got enough meat to feed the neighborhood. But I've just gone to the bra. You understand? And yet there's people who are walking down the road, houses in the same neighborhood that do not even have. We need to get this right. We need to be a church that understands that God has provided. He provided the manna way back in the old times. Jesus provided when he broke. It's a spiritual gift that we have. We have got the means. It's time that we started to feed just the one. Just the one. Just the one. But we also need to look after those that are emotionally hungry. Those that are longing for a relationship, those that are in a broken space, those that are just emotionally just are, are so desperate for a friend, so desperate for... And Jesus says, come to me, all of you that are heavy and burdened. 
Come and take upon my yoke, for it's easy and it's light. Jesus invites us in our emotional state to come to him. And surely we should be inviting those that are around us into a space where we can also journey. There are those that are spiritually hungry. We are all spiritually hungry. We are born desiring more of God. Jesus says you must be born again. And when you're born again, suddenly you have a sense that there's the Holy Spirit and, and we wait for more of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And as we mature, we have more of the Holy Spirit coming into our lives. The promise of our Heavenly Father, when Jesus was resurrected, and he said to those, those early disciples, wait for the promise of the Father. And when Jesus ascended into heaven and the Holy Spirit was given, life, spiritual life, new life, we hunger for these things. Let's understand that to be hungry does not mean to just have physical food. And I say that for a reason, because some of you are sitting here genuinely don't have physical food to give to somebody else, but you can feed somebody emotionally. You can feed somebody spiritually. You can be a part of their journey. Jesus reminds us in John chapter 6 that he is the bread of life. That he is the bread of life. He invites us to embrace this gift, this eternal spiritual food that is found in him and in him alone. We can eat all we want here on earth. We can eat all the stuff of earth, all the worldly stuff, but it's not going to get us into heaven. It's only the bread of Jesus, the bread of life that he is. He is our spiritual bread there is no earthly substitute that can replace who he is and what he offers, what he sustains, what he nurtures, what he satisfies. Jesus said we cannot live on bread alone, but on every living word that comes from God. And so often we forget, we make this, we make this a starter, and perhaps we make it a dessert, this is the main course. This, this is what truly feeds us. This. We need to have the other stuff. But the Word of God, the Word of God, the Word of God changes us. The Word of God fills us. The Word of God just gives life to us. So what does it mean to feed the hungry? Well, that's simple, obvious stuff. I'm hungry for something to eat. That's what it means to feed the hungry. When somebody sits there with that, that stomach cramp from hunger. But I'm also hungry for friendship, for relationship. I'm hungry for companionship. I'm hungry for, for something to, to, it's emotional. I'm hungry for more of God. That's what we should all be hungry for in, in this space because we know, we've met, we've seen, we've experienced, but we want more. And so physically hungry, we, we go out, we, we feed our soup kitchen, the stuff that we do, the ministries that we do. And so if you can give a tin or a packet of this or a bit of that, from this moment forward, from this Sunday forward, I want to encourage you to not wait to be called upon to bring something for our food ministry, but to bring it. Not because you've been told, not because you've been prompted, not because you've been made to feel guilty, but because you're a sheep and you've heard the shepherd's voice and he has said, feed the hungry. Perhaps you can't, perhaps you've got a rand, just one rand. Perhaps you've got 50 cents. My Benjamin I love him to bits. He's been an absolute blessing in my life. I'm, I'm a passionate shark supporter, and I have a piggy bank. <laughs> I am a passionate shark supporter amongst the ridicule, and I have a piggy bank. It says sharks is bakrat, by the way. Am I allowed to say that? Yeah, yeah okay. Um, but at the bottom, it's got a, the thing where you take out, and it's quite a big one. And I've been filling that with five rand coins for, I don't know, a good couple of years. 
I get home during the week, and Benjamin's got a Tupperware bowl, and he's got all these five rand coins inside of it. And I'm like, and he's like, look at all my money. And I'm like, I didn't think. And I'm like, oh, that's cool. And like, where did you get it from? No, I don't know. I said, I said Ben, I said, Ben, where? No, no, seriously, but where did you get it from? No, I can't remember. I'm going, hmm. Benjamin, where did you get it from? And, I, and he gets all, and, and he knows he's been caught out. So, um. <laughs> so I go through to my study and I find my piggy bank. And he's only taken half out. <laughs> so he's left me some, very generous of him. <laughs> So I take it in and teach him the lesson that you don't take without asking and all of that. And he gets all tearful and cries and sobs and, and I hope we have dad and son moment. But in that space, I just realized, just five rand. When you add it all together. So there was over a thousand rand in that piggy bank just from five rand coins that had been put together. The reason I'm sharing the story is not about Benjamin and the piggy bank. But it's about your 50 cents, my 50 cents, your one rand my one ran, when we put it all together, it makes something more, and we're able to do more with it. So it's not about how much I give, it's just about having the right heart and being able to give. And so we give the physical. We need to be a church that does the physical, feeds just the one, feeds the 10, feeds the 50. But we also need to be a part of those that are struggling with emotional starvation, those that are sitting in our midst this morning who have a loneliness, a pain, an anxiety. Those that are just in moments where they are broken and they just need somebody to feed them, somebody to love them, just to be present in their lives, just to be present. It can sometimes be the greatest food into an emotional crisis, just to have somebody with you. We've all been there. We've all known that. We've all, make the call. Seriously, don't send the text. Pick up the phone. It's good, it's good old-fashioned stuff, this. I'm looking out at you. Now, most of you can still remember what it's like to do you remember the phones that you, and then you did the wrong number, and you had to start all over again? There's like, you couldn't just backtrack. You're like, oh, Lord. Remember? Make the call. Speak. Because your voice might just break into that loneliness, into the silence that somebody is dealing with inside of their being. And if they don't answer the phone, send the text. Because sometimes when we are emotionally starved and we're in an emotionally place of real broken and we are hungering just for something, just to have a text that says, I'm here for you. If you need me, I'll be there. Let's be the church that's there to encourage. Pop in for the visit. Don't just say, I'll visit. Make the time. Go and visit. Take the step. Be the church that supports, that encourages, that's there to listen, but ultimately that's there to love. And then there's those who are deeply spiritually hungry. Sometimes they don't even know how to feed themselves. They're in such a broken space. And so as the church, we gather and we pray. We pray, we intercede we intercede for the loved ones that we have, for the friends, the colleagues that so desperately need Jesus, need the bread of life. We sing in their silence. We guide them into the Word. We guide them through the Word. We guide them with the Word. We don't take the Word and throw it at them and say, Jesus said in John 14 that He's the way, the truth, and the life, and if you don't believe in Him, da 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 No, no. We go and say, Jesus said, that God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son. But that the son didn't come to condemn, but that the son came to give life. Remember the thief comes to lie, steal, kill, destroy. You've experienced that in your life. But Jesus, our Jesus, my Jesus, the Jesus that I want you to meet, he has come so that you can have life and life in abundance. He's the good shepherd. 
He's the good shepherd. We guide. We share our testimonies. In the book of Revelation, it says that they overcame him, speaking about the devil, the evil one. They overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony. You have a story to tell that will change somebody's life. Tell the story. Tell people about Jesus. Feed them. Feed them with the bread of life. But the truth is where it gets really hard for us this morning is that in that separation, when we don't feed the least of these, we are separated from the glory. We are separated from the presence. The words of Jesus, depart from me, you who are cursed, into the everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. You may think that this is for somebody else to do. You may think that this is for some ministry or cause or some project. But I want to tell you today that we as the church of Christ have been mandated by Jesus to feed the hungry, the physical, the emotional, and the spiritual. It is time for us to stand up and to step out. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we, as we sit, a hard word, a hard truth, but may it be a word that, that rattles, convicts, and that moves us to do. May it not just go in our ears and out our lives, but may it be a word that may it be a seed sown today. No matter how little we feel it is, Lord, help us to be the church that feeds the hungry. Lord, when we don't have the physical means, Lord, help us to be there in that emotional space. Lord, if we and ourselves are not able to emotionally give, Lord, help us to be the ones to help us to be the ones that don't leave our friends, our loved ones, our neighbors outside of the sheepfold. But that Lord, we invite them in to the glory of your presence. So Lord, bless our day. Bless our mothers, bless our memories. Bless our tears and bless our smiles in the precious name of Jesus. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.